Good spiritual leaders always consult God instead of getting into arguments. I'm going to be looking for the name of somebody's son. And trumpets and Passover. All of this and more coming up next on the Quick Study Television program. Stay there. We begin now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. I'm Corey. This is Quick Study, a television program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. And today we're focusing on Numbers chapter 9 through 10. Now this is interesting because one of the things we'll be focusing on today as we go through the Bible in one year, which is what we're doing, is in Numbers 9 and 10 is this. And it's a very interesting point to be made. That is spiritual laws. There are spiritual laws in place. Let me give you one example we'll talk about later. If we live by the letter of the law, instead of the grace of God, we will always be condemned. Mm -hmm. So we'll explain all of that and, and expand it. Do you like that's a word I made up? That was very explain nice. Explain and expand. We'll expand very it. Nice. Okay. That's like trendencies. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Got it. You don't have to make new words up just to throw the dictionary off every once in a while. All right. Speaking of throwing the dictionary off, what about the ancient past and archaeology? What's up? Well, Numbers chapter 10 talks about the silver trumpet. So we're going to do a little bit of a spin off of trumpets and see how trumpets really played out through history. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. These are the trumpets we'll talk about maybe in the discussion segment. We also have the Bible IQ question, which is what? Yes. Who was Hobab? Was he the son of Enon, the son of Pagiel, or the son of Reuel? All right. Who was he? Who? Ob, what? Obab? Reuel. No. Hobab. 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 All right. <laughs> We're going to nail that down later on. Stay there. common modern scientific knowledge that the earth floats in free space suspended by nothing affected only by gravity but ancient sources of man declared as in the case of China that the earth was suspended on the back of a turtle or in India an elephant held the earth up or in ancient Greece Atlas held the earth up but the Bible is unique in that this ancient document is the only one that makes a true statement Job 26.7 says, God hangs the earth on nothing. of the making of two silver trumpets. Now, trumpets in the ancient world are a category in and of themselves. If I'm going to be honest, really, we could do an entire show just talking of the cultural implications of the trumpet, the ins and the outs, the practical uses, the symbolic uses. But instead of doing that, because it would be a lot of trumpets combined into one show, what I'm going to do is take you uh, a little bit forward in history from Numbers and look at how the trumpet aspect really played out in the land of Israel. And it really matured and grew, especially when uh, there was an actual physical temple built. It wasn't a tent like the tabernacle, but an actual temple. So take a look at this, the trumpeter's stone. Throughout the Old Testament, trumpet blasts were known to come before an appearing or a manifestation of God. Trumpets were blown when God commanded, often before a major event, like the collapsing walls of Jericho. There was even a special day reserved for blowing trumpets for Jewish New Year, opening up a sacred month. 
the tradition of trumpets continued on into New Testament times. Trumpets were employed in Herod's temple in Jerusalem to signify the beginning and ending of the Sabbath, a day of rest given to God. The Jewish Mishnah, a body of laws, tells us that six trumpet blasts would sound the beginning of the Sabbath, three to cause the people to stop their work, and then three more to distinguish the beginning of the sacred day. In 1986, excavations began on what was once Jerusalem's main road, adjacent to the Temple Mount. In the rubble of this street, they uncovered the trumpeter's stone. Perched high on the southwest corner of the Temple Mount, each week a priest would blow the trumpet from this very stone. Our reading assignment today, Numbers chapter 9 through 10, let's put it in context through truth text. Now, the purpose of God's rituals and feast is not to bind man and condemn him, but to teach his soul about the character of a saving and healing God. So, Numbers 9 brings a serious Passover crisis. The Passover was due to be celebrated, but some had faced death in their families, and they were caught in the law because they were defiled. So Moses, like a good spiritual leader, consults God. And in chapter 10, the public address system is instated from ancient Israel. From now, Israel moves away from the mountain using the same system wherever they went. Numbers 9, verses 1 through 8. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai on the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month, at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time. According to all its rites and ceremonies you shall keep it. So Moses told the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did. Now there were certain men who were defiled by a human corpse so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron that day, and those men said to him, We became defiled by a human corpse. Why are we kept from presenting the offering of the Lord at its appointed time among the children of Israel? And Moses said to them, Stand still, that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. Numbers chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. This is a most interesting and amazing package of Scripture talking about the letter of the law. Now, we're looking at Numbers chapters 9 and 10. Now, because of man's duplicity and his weak nature, history has shown that things must be written down to have authority. Have you ever noticed that? Seems like when it's written down, you take it more seriously, right? Well, this is the idea of a country being governed by law, not by the moods of man, which... Lord willing, the uh, country of Canada and the United States are. However, the Bible adds yet another dimension to this particular reality. In the end, no inanimate law can successfully govern an animate life. You see, wisdom in governing comes in mercy, in grace, and in truth. So Numbers 9 reflects how God adjusts his requirements for the Passover in a no-win situation for his people. You see, the Feast of God and the Passover, the celebrations and the Sabbath, these were not to bind man and, and make him somehow obligated to do this or God would stomp on him or send him to hell. No, these were to remind the people of who God is and was. Now, as we look at this and we consider what's happened here, what's happened is these men, uh, 
cannot fulfill the Passover because they're unclean. So here we see if you go by the letter of the law, the law has now conflicted in itself. This happens frequently even in modern times. So how do you deal with this? Well, God gives us a great example. Numbers chapter 9, 6, and 7. Let's put it on the screen. Now, there were certain men who were defiled by a human corpse so that they could not keep the Passover. They were unclean on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron that day, and those men said to them, you know, we became defiled by a human corpse. Not that we went looking for it, but it just happened to us. Why are we kept from presenting an offering to the Lord at its appointed time among the children of Israel? We want to participate in this. We don't want to just let it go. Now, this brings us to a very important precept and concept written within the law. If we live by the letter of the law instead of by the grace of God, we will always be condemned. And yet Paul says to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore there no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Proverbs clearly says this, a very important point. By truth and mercy is iniquity purged. By the fear of God do men depart from evil. And so this idea, as we study, you know, through the, through the law, uh, the Torah, uh, this idea of grace is built right into it. I find that amazing. Watch this. Numbers 9, 8. Watch this. And Moses said to them, stand still. Don't do anything that I may hear what the Lord commanded concerning you. Now look at this principle. Truth to live by, number two. When you're caught in a spiritual conflict, good spiritual leaders always consult God instead of instituting arguments in spiritual conflicts. Instead of Moses saying, I'm Moses when I say you can't worship because it's the letter of the law, he didn't do that. Moses saw their hearts and he said, you know, these men, they just want to serve God. So Moses goes to God and God makes provision. Isn't that just like the Lord? God doesn't break his law, but he adds to it grace. See, God never breaks his law, but he adds to it grace and mercy. So to the Torah, what was added? Yeshua HaMashiach, salvation, the grace of Christ. Boy, this is intense. All right, now let's look at Numbers 9, 9 to 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I want you to speak to the children of Israel. I want you to say this. If any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of this idea of being defiled by a corpse or is far away on a journey, he may still keep the Lord's Passover. Verse 11. You see, on the 14th day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones according to all the ordinances of the Passover. They shall keep it. Beloved, this last truth to live by is so important for all of us to hear today. Those of us who love to run the letter of the law, Jesus Christ came to rub it out, not to rub it in. My father... Ron Hembry, my late father, used to say that, and I loved that saying so much. But, you know, have you ever known somebody who just really identifies with the rules and the regulations of the Bible, and they're just ready to pounce on it and make it a rule and a regulation? And yet, many times in their own lives, the rules and the regulations will cause them to be condemned. You see, the truth is, it's, it's like a bridge. There's a bridge, you know, and it goes from Canada to uh, the United States in Buffalo and from the United States to Canada. It's called the Peace Bridge. It's at Fort Air in Buffalo, and it says, absolutely no stopping on the bridge. So you're thinking, okay, but then traffic backs up. You're stopping on the bridge. You're breaking the law. Well, you're stuck in a situation. Well, the police don't run up and down and give out tickets. They understand that the principle is don't stop on the bridge to look at the water. But sometimes we get into situations, and that's what Jesus Christ has provided for us. The grace of Christ helps us to move into the will of God. Consider these things today. Chapter 9 sees Israel under the leadership of Moses and the Lord celebrating 
Passover, the Feast of Passover. Now, I cannot imagine being these people, knowing their history coming out of Egypt, know, that knowing that they knew exactly what Passover meant, and it meant it was so personal for them. They had seen the miracle. They had experienced the miracle. And now here they are celebrating the feast in the wilderness. I cannot even imagine what that would be like. Well, it became a part, as you know, it became a part of the Israelite culture and the religious practices. And we even see it being played out in the New Testament with Jesus and his disciples, right? The Last Supper took place during the time of Passover. So what you and I are going to take a little bit of a look at right now is Passover and the Last Supper and we're going to try to connect these two ideas in the way the ancient people would have understood them. Uh, now we can't get it exactly because we weren't there but we can construct from history most likely what they would have thought about the situation. <laughs> The Last Supper has been a topic for many great painters and theologians alike. Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal instituted by God through Moses. Jesus was fulfilling the Passover. In Exodus 12, the Passover is explained. To avoid the last plague of Egypt, the death of the firstborn, each Israelite family was to select a perfect male lamb Keep it for a certain amount of time, then slaughter it, eating it as a Passover meal, and taking the lamb's blood and putting it on their doorposts. The blood was a sign to God that they were his, that their sins had been atoned for, and they would be passed over by this plague of death. Jesus was showing that he himself was the Passover lamb, that from then on, no lamb needed to be killed and eaten. Jesus was the final Passover lamb. Change the atmosphere of your workplace or home by listening to I Sing Radio online at www.biblediscoverytv.com. Commercial free, no radio telethons, just worship and praise 24-7 at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Be sure to follow the links to online radio, then click on I Sing. Over one-third of the Bible is prophecy. The 66 books of the Bible have a perfect record of prophecies fulfilled. But what does the Bible say about the immediate future of the world? And what about the future of Israel? Does the recent rash of birds falling out of the sky, millions of dead fish, and cattle dying have any significance according to the Bible? Join Rod Hembry in his compelling two-set audio CD series called The Coming Storm. This set is a fascinating Bible study on the complexion of the coming one world empire, the rescue of Israel, and the mysterious disappearance of the church, all predicted from the pages of the Holy Scripture. Call or write today for your copy of the Coming Storm Bible Study on Near Future and End of Time with Rod Hembry. When you write or call, please remember that Quick Study is viewer supported, and we need your help to continue teaching through God's Word. Suggested donation is $25, and to receive your copy of The Coming Storm, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156680150. You can also use the Internet, or you can call and talk to someone in the office. Call today, write today, and get your copy of The Coming Storm. Places, places, places. 
people. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. Modern medicine has discovered that when dealing and confronting deadly diseases, clothes and the body should be washed under running water. But did you know that for centuries, people naively washed in standing water, creating extra death and disease? Today, modern medicine recognizes the need to wash germs away in fresh water. But did you know that over 3,000 years ago, God spoke to Moses and told him, when dealing with infectious disease, wash the body and the clothes under running water. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13. Most religions have some kind of so-called holy writ to which they must adjust their thinking in order to be good or satisfy those particular ordinances. But in Christianity, the Holy Bible is not seen as simply the written law, but literally the very DNA of a living person. That person is Yeshua HaMashiach, the living word. Now the Bible contains the codes of life embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. Now this difference brings the Christian to the altar of change for a different reasons. True Christians are motivated to change by love, not law, and to seek moral virtue because they love Christ, not because if they don't, they're going to get zapped by him. Now that's very different motivation than we see in much of the world religions even today. Actually, Corey, also in a lot of what we study in history and archaeology. Any more sure. comments on your historical discoveries today? <laughs> um, not really. I mean, it, it was all very straightforward, but it's amazing how the Bible speaks of something and, and then history and archaeology will just give it that clarity that we need. And we live in such a privileged time because everything is literally just at our fingertips. We mm -hmm. have history books. We have the internet. We have uh, journals of archaeology. It's all right there. One of the things you said I think is very important and uh, Professor Albright said it too. He was a great archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And what, he, what they said and what they claimed was that history and archaeology brought resolution yes. to much of what the Bible said, mm -hmm. that it's not there to necessarily counter, and so we abandon the Bible and then go find something else. Mm -hmm. But it's there to bring resolution. Yes. And that was also said by Gleason Archer, Dr. Gleason Archer, and many other fine archaeologists. Uh, but I think William F. Albright is one of my favorites uh, <laughs> just because of the work he did early on. Very good. What did you learn when studying for this Bible IQ question, Janice? Well, I was just doing some research on different name meanings. There's a lot of names that are packed into numbers. And you like the names, don't I you? I do. You really like the names. <laughs> All, right. All right, here we go. Here, We're what? looking for somebody today. Who was Hobab? Was he the son of Enon? Was he the son of Pagiel, or was he the son of Reuel? Okay, now, the son of... Uh, what, what do you think, Corey? I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's Reuel. I, I would agree, if this is the Reuel that I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. Let me read it to you. Numbers 10, verse 29. Now Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we will treat you well. This was Moses' brother-in-law, the son of Reuel. And Moses you know, Janice, yeah, because, I mean, he married a daughter of the priest of On. Yes. Which, uh, now, that, that whole idea. A Midianite. I think we forget about it, a Midianite, uh, descendants of Midian. Yes. And I think it's interesting because when we get prior to uh, the, the sons of Midian, that would be Amnon and Midian, these were the descendants of Lot. Uh, by incest. But one of the interesting things to me is that when Joseph is sold into slavery, in one place it says they were the Ishmaelites, in another place it says they were the Midianites. Mm -hmm. So we surmise from that that perhaps the Ishmaelites and the Midianites had an alliance. And that becomes interesting because Reuel, or Jethro, right. as he sometimes yes. is called, mm -hmm. is the father in law of Moses. He actually detaches himself from those ancient. Uh, ideas or cultures, and he joins uh, the, the new land or the new nation of Israel, in fact, gives advice. 
to Moses. He does. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the advice God was doesn't, it was good advice. <laughs> God doesn't reject it. And so, you know, you should listen to your father-in-law every once in a while. <laughs> Has some good advice. My father-in-law had great advice. Uh, anyway, so this, this priest of on, uh, his, his, Moses must have had several things in his mind. He had the ancient religious practices of Egypt. He grew mm -hmm. up in the house of Pharaoh. But then there were the religious practices of Midian. Yeah. And, you know, Corey, you've studied this as well. With all the surrounding distractions, to, ben, to now be receiving all of these new commands must have been mm -hmm. really strange to mm -hmm. Moses, really strange. Anyway, uh, it's sometimes strange to us too when we read the scripture, but we're going to read it anyway. Here's meditation and memorization passage. Jan will read for us. Numbers 9, 9 through 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If any one of you or your posterity is unclean because of a corpse or is far away on a journey, he may still keep the Lord's Passover. On the 14th day of the second month at twilight, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break one of its bones. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. So God makes provision when you can't keep the letter of the law, even in the Torah. God makes provision of grace when the circumstances are not helping you. Grace is the foundation of God's law. Think about that. Uh, nobody is good enough, nobody can perform well enough, nobody's rich enough, nobody's smart enough, nobody's cute enough, nobody's witty enough. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What it means is we have been born in a condition of sin because of the first parents. Look around, the world is in shape that it's in because of sin, not because God made it this way. But the Bible says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, what it means is, it's not a performance thing. It's a giving of the heart. It's a making a decision to follow Jesus Christ. And if you make that decision today, say, Lord, man, I need, I need some help here. I need to know you. I need to figure out who I am and what I'm supposed to do. Come to Jesus Christ today. Believe in him, and he will help you. Thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study Television program. Tomorrow, what happens when the people of God do nothing but complain instead of praise? We'll be talking about that. Join us on Quick Study. Also, remember, we're viewer supported and we could use your help. Our website, you can give there at BibleDiscoveryTV.com.